Today, a deep dive into the divisions in our country. Don't be fooled into thinking that this can be traced back to the 60s or even the Civil War. The battle lines over everything from guns to civil rights were drawn hundreds of years ago before the country was even founded. In his book, American Nations, Colin Woodard traced the cultural and ethnic histories of Americans in various parts of the country, and he explored how those experiences have come to define the regions they live in today. In order to map the regional cultures, Woodard split North America into 11 separate nations, each with its own values and perspectives. And what he found was that the prevailing attitudes were framed by the original people who settled there, not the ones who live there now. And it's those settlers who were shaped by their own experiences before they even set foot on North America. Take, for example, the issues of guns and violence. The states with the highest rate of deadly assaults are in the Deep South and uh, Appal Greater Appalachia and the Far West. And yet many of these same states resist stricter gun reform. In fact, in the seven states dominated by the Deep South, 12 of the 14 senators voted against the background check bill in April. But to figure out why, Woodard looked at the culture of these regions, but not through the lens of modern day politics. Take Appalachia right over here. These were founded by settlers from war-ravaged areas of Northern Ireland, Northern England, and the Scottish Lowlands. Cue Jim Webb here, by the way. Areas well-versed in violence whose people are fiercely committed to individual liberty. People in the far west were tied to eastern powers out here who supported their settlements and still fight against outside intervention. The Deep South was shaped by the fight over slavery and creating uh, an ongoing battle against expanded federal powers. By contrast, the safest states in the country were in Yankeedom or the Quaker-founded Midlands. The rate of assault deaths, if, for instance, there is less than two per 100,000. And in the six states tucked in the northeastern uh, corner of Yankeedom, 11 of the 12 senators voted in favor of the background check bill. Again, it's more about the people who settled these regions than the people who live there now. So again, we look at Yankeedom, founded by radical Calvinists in the 1600s, people who put an emphasis on what? Social engineering as a way to improve society and were therefore more comfortable with a collective of sorts, more comfortable with government regulations. Then you have the Midlands right here in the area just below, basically the Midwest, founded by English Quakers. Government is a little less welcome, but people still believe society should be organized around a middle class. Joining me now is the man that put all this together, Colin Woodard. He is currently state and national affairs writer for the Portland Press Herald and the Maine Sunday Telegram. And as we mentioned, he's the author of this book, American Nations, A History of the Eleven Rival Regional Cultures of North America. Uh, Colin, just a great way and a reminder to look at this, and uh, particularly when you were writing about Appalachia, uh, I go back to a book that uh, former Senator Jim Webb wrote about the whole history of the Scotch-Irish in America, and he was born making fighting. that same case. <laughs> yeah, born fighting. Making that Absolutely. same case Absolutely. about guns in particular and the gun culture, and as he tried to translate it to the modern Democratic Party. Absolutely. And a number of people have looked at different aspects of regionalism. This is the first effort to really bring it all into one sort of unified framework so we can understand it on a continental scale. I guess what's, what's um, odd here is the fact that, it, it, that this is all 400 years in the making and despite the fact that, for instance, let's look at the South, a very transient area, and there's been so, much, uh, so many people moving there, and yet it hasn't changed the culture of the South when it comes to certain issues like guns. Why is that? Right. Well, that and many other issues, these are the dominant cultures, the dominant regional cultures in our country. I argue that there's not really one American culture, but several Americas. And so, in short, when people have moved in, their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren aren't assimilating to an American culture, but to one of these regional cultures. So the overall ethos and characteristics tends to persist over time. And uh, another factor is that as people have been moving around, it's been discovered, uh, Bill Bishop's book, The Big Sort, looked at this, that people are choosing uh, uh, to a large degree where they move based on places where they feel comfortable. And as they're doing that, they actually are tending to sort themselves into these nations as well, self-selecting where they go in ways that uh, end up emphasizing 
synthesizing rather than reducing the differences between these uh, cultural spaces that I've, I've mapped out here. So how do you govern this, right? If we're 11 nations, uh, how, do, how do you end up governing in the modern era? I mean, we're sitting here talking about, it, it, let's take the health care law. Uh, we know the deepest uh, skepticism about health care, about the health care law, is coming from the South uh, and, to a lesser extent, Appalachia. And, of course, this has been done on the backs of people from, of Democrats from the Midwest, uh, the coast, and Yankeedom. Yeah, and that's a fissure that you see repeatedly throughout our history in a whole range of uh, policy and historical issues. Yes, that's been the trick of, uh, of maintaining our federation and thriving throughout our history. And we've had some terrible times in the past, like the Civil War. The trick to um, overcoming this, that the, some of the positions are irreconcilable. You're, you're never going to have the Deep South approach on some of these issues. And Yankeedoms really see eye to eye and be able to find compromise because there's not a lot of overlap. So what's happened in our history, and presumably will have to happen moving forward, is that one or the other of the current political blocs, we can call them the Red and the Blue Coalition today, would mm -hmm. have to figure out a way to modify their message so as to build a larger regional coalition, either by capturing one of the partners from the other camp or by winning over, winning over one of the swing nations because currently neither of the blocks, there's sort of a blue block if you want, that is New right. Netherland and Yankeedom and the left coast against a red block that currently is the deep south, uh, greater Appalachia and the far west. And neither of those have the real dominant power to control reliably uh, the levers of federal power in Washington, which are now, you know, you need the White House and a filibuster-proof right. Senate majority and control of the House of Representatives. Neither of them have the numbers to do that. So it's all about um, messaging to win a broader coalition, or I think we're going to remain for a long time in this state where it keeps switching from one coalition to the other and we remain completely deadlocked with neither group able to overcome the resistance of the other in Washington. Well, I want to go back to the map here because I feel like I think we know the swing area here if you look back at just in the last two generations. So if we buy the idea that we know where red America is, we know where blue America is here, um, that the swing area then is actually the far west. And if you look back in time when the Republicans were ascendant in the 80s, it was because they were doing well out west, the Colorados, the Arizonas, the Nevadas, and now Absolutely. Democrats uh, seem ascendant nationally in, the, in these presidential elections because they're winning the far. I mean, is it fair to say that this is the swing uh, nation of your 11 nations? Well, historically over, you know, this is a work of history, over 400 years, the Midlands has been the classic swing nation and remains so. You know, it, um, it, it forms an important part of the great swing states mm -hmm. of Ohio and Pennsylvania and Missouri. But what right. you say about the far west is very true. It's the weak coalition partner right now in the, in the red coalition, we can call it, and in the past has not necessarily been part of that coalition and I think is the one that is most open to be um, to, to join a, uh, a, a the blue coalition, as it were, if the right. messaging uh, were different, and the mm -hmm. um, the Republicans, you know, have a way also in the the, the sort of red coalition to perhaps re-message towards El Norte, which is expanding demographically rapidly, um, which is something I think that former President Bush uh, was planning on doing, and and has right. since fallen off the agenda. Well, I hope the best thing we've done for folks is to, number one, make them realize they need to read your book, Colin. That's number one. And number two, a reminder, European history is important to Americans if you want to understand American politics today between the Scotch Irish and, and Calvin, all these things. history as well. Absolutely. Anyway, you were terrific. Thank you for this. Thank you for your book. A wonderful way to look uh, at our modern day divide through the lens of history. Thanks very much. Well, our first read 2016 roundup is coming up. And a programming note for you House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, the former speaker, will be David Gregory's guest this Sunday on NBC's Meet the Press. But first, the wild soup of the day it's seafood gumbo today. We'll be right back. <laughs> 